Bonjour Varsovie, ça va Yeah. yeah. Well, no, actually, uh, I will do this in English. Um, so, carpenters and cartographers. That's a weird title, isn't it? Well, fully, uh, it, it will make sense by the end of the talk. Um, see, I pretty much love words. Uh, I love the, the way they interact. Uh, I love tracking their lineage uh, through history and across, across different languages. And so, in the next few minutes, uh, I'd like to uh, take you on a trip with words. But before we start, um, I'd like to ask a very simple question. Oops. What is it to be a software developer? What is the essence of our job? It's a pretty simple question, right? And the, the answer is rather re easy. First, someone has an idea of something that could be done with computers. He tells us his idea, we think about it, we draw a bunch of diagrams, and finally we end up with some text in a programming language. Then we feed that text into uh, some kind of build system to obtain an executable file. And of course, since we are lazy or pragmatic, we don't, talk, we don't write all the code by ourselves. We often use uh, a bunch of libraries coming across the network. And of course, if we are using Spark, there would be, say, two slide worth of these libraries. But say we have a few of them. And finally, we obtain our package. So we can ask, ask the OS to uh, tell the CPU to run our code. During that process, uh, the CPU will talk with, say, a database, or maybe other servers across the network. Or if you are still working in the 20th century, it will talk to printers. But more importantly, it will talk to devices that with, with which a user can interact. Because the whole point of that is to produce value to users. And maybe we hope that these users will generate revenue for us. So after all, that's a pretty complex process. If you were to understand it completely, we would have to uh, learn about physics and electronics and networking and language theory and maybe psychology, sociology, and so on. So that's a whole bunch of complexity. So how do we manage not to go crazy with that amount of complexity? Well, we use something that is maybe our most powerful, powerful tool, which is abstraction. With abstraction, we are, we are, we are able to uh, understand our surroundings. Using abstraction, we were able to uh, understand mechanics and send people to the moon. Abstraction works if we look at the word. It's com it comes from Latin, abstract, which is putting away, pulling away. Abstraction works by selecting some aspects of a complex system or object and putting aside details that we don't need to uh, reason about. And so abstractions are a tool to make something which is complex, simpler. But in the meantime, in the same time, uh, abstraction can be difficult to understand and to grasp. And so we often resort to another tool in order to understand new abstractions. And this other tool is metaphor. Metaphor is, if you look at the roots of the word, it's meta, so alongside in Greek, and forhain, which is bring, carry. A metaphor, uh, somehow, when we use it to understand new abstraction, it maps abstract things to concrete things. And since concrete things are simpler to understand, it makes a good uh, tool to understand new, new abstractions. Metaphors work by creating a system of analogies 
that works together to create a new understanding. For example, if I come across a girl in the street and I say to her, your eyes are blue like the sky, it's just a merely an analogy. But if I continue and I say, and a thousand stars twinkle in them, it becomes a metaphor and also the worst pickup line ever. So using these systems of analogy, which are metaphors, we can understand new abstractions. To get back to our uh, example, remember when we were kids and we had to learn to count, we were presented to this abstraction which can be very difficult to understand, numbers. And so we used our fingers as metaphor to numbers in order to learn how to count. See, each finger is a digit, one, two, three, four, five, and putting up a finger is addition, putting down a finger is subtraction. And this was really useful to learn how to count. But at some point, you have to unlearn the metaphor that made easy the learning in the first place, because to, get the, to keep the same example, you cannot make a division using your finger or multiplication, or you cannot even represent real numbers. So at some point, you have to unlearn the metaphor and get beyond it to grab the real abstraction, right? And by the way, um, the word digit in English is an analogy with fingers. In Latin, digitas is the finger. So you see this triad, analogy, metaphor, abstraction, works together. And metaphors are so important that some scientists like George Lakoff, who is a linguist, a PhD student of Noam Chomsky, you should maybe have heard about Noam Chomsky, and he has this theory that says that our languages are purely metaphorical, that everything we say is somehow, to some extent, a metaphor with some in internal process in our bodies. So this is a rather uh, controversial theory, but we have to admit that metaphors are really important to the way we think. I strongly believe that the metaphor we use on a daily basis have an impact, a very deep impact on how we see the reality, how we see the world. But, there are problems with metaphors. First, metaphors pertain to a certain cultural, cultural context. For example, we all, we've all heard the, the metaphor saying that um, monads are like burritos. But if you know nothing about Mexican food, this metaphor is no use to you. Actually, even if you know Mexican food, the metaphor is not very good, but that's not the point. <laughs> so that's a problem. You cannot share metaphors with everybody because you have to have some intersection with your cultural context to share it. Secondly, metaphors do not abide laws. The structure, the system of analogy they are built upon is really not strict. You cannot reason about a metaphor. You cannot use a metaphor to produce new knowledge. It's only good to allow you to learn something new about an abstraction, but you cannot push it further. And finally, metaphors tend to stick because they make difficult things easy it's really tempting to, to stick to a metaphor that was useful at some point and not get beyond the point where you really grab the abstraction that it was meant to allow you to un understand in the first, pl first place. It's also tempting to, when you have been seduced by a, a, a seducing metaphor, to push it further and to expand it way beyond it should have been in, in the first place. Actually, uh, and maybe I will not make friends by saying that, uh, 
object-oriented programming is an example of a metaphor that has been pushed way too far. In the beginning, um, people created objects and the notion of objects in programming um, as an attempt to make an abstraction. The idea was to uh, hide implementation details under interfaces and help developers to sort things out. The problem is objects are not really an abstraction. You don't have a way that allows you to reason about them. You cannot say in, av in advance how to compose objects. It's case by case. So to me, objects is really a metaphor that has been just pushed too far away. And this culminates in this book, Design Patterns. I mean, everyone has read or ever at least uh, heard about this book. And I have quite a, a, a lot of problem with this book. The problem starts, my problem with this book starts on the cover of it. It's not a problem with the drawing, nor it is with the authors, nor with the, with the subtitle, but I have a problem with the usage of the word design in the title. So please, don't speak about design in software. I mean, not to me. I, I'm French, as you have guessed. And in French, uh, design has a very precise meaning. It uh, denotes things that are built with as much emphasis on beauty as on usefulness. So for example, the chair on the left is an instance of design, while the chair on the right isn't. They are both useful, but there is only one which is beautiful, okay? And so in my French mind, when I, earned, when I hear uh, design patterns, I feel that it pushes, it puts too much emphasis on beauty in software. And I don't think uh, beauty is a property of code. Code can, can have a lot of properties uh, like, say, readability, reasonability, uh, maintainability, and so on. But beauty is not a property of code, in my opinion. But enough with the, with the cover of the, of the book. Let's look at the content. This is a list of the design patterns. And all I see there is metaphors, metaphors everywhere. I mean, I have no clue about how to compose, uh, say, an interpreter with a state, or an abstract factory with a template method. There is no, no point. And even worse, there's a lot of these metaphors that are di directly drawn from the domain and the vocabulary of construction. If you get this, plus the fact that we use a whole bunch of words that are di directly drawn from this context, for example, we have architects, we use uh, building blocks and plumbing and, and so on. And if we get back to uh, what we said uh, earlier with George Lakoff, that metaphors we use have an impact on how we see the, the, the reality. It gives what I call the cap carpenter, carpenter mindset, which sees our job as a creative one. Or to summarize it differently, carpenters, it builds things or fixes broken stuff. And I feel this is wrong. Because when you, create, when you think you create something, you become attached with what you've created. And so when change comes, because the business has changed, or someone says that, yeah, it's not bite to the standards of how we do things and so on, you can become really frustra frustrated, right? And I feel that this mindset uh, is probably the cause of most of the frustration we have in this job. And putting 
too much on faces, on metaphors, we forget that these metaphors were, were only met, meant to uh, help us understand and grasp new abstractions. And abstractions is the thing we should care about. When I say abstractions, of course, I say mathematical abstractions. These abstractions have much nicer properties than metaphors. First, they are universal. You don't need a, a, a cultural baggage to understand what a functor or a monad or an applicative is. You only need to understand more basic abstractions, okay? No need to know about Mexican food to understand what a monad is. Abstractions are permanent. They are based on, upon mathematics, and once you have proven a, th a theorem, it's true forever. Arguably, it was even true before you've proven it, but that's not the problem. So there will not be, say, category theory version 2 that will make obsolete your functors and monads and so on. So abstractions are permanent. And finally, that's the whole point of them. They are lawful. They abide law, laws. It's the very core of it. These are these laws that help you detect abstraction in something complex. And you can see, oh, this is a functor, this is a monoid, and so on. And moreover, these laws gets, give you a way to compose these abstractions, because that's the point. You want to abstract and then compose these abstractions. And so the lo these laws uh, tell you that you will be able to compose, say, um, two applicative functors, and so on. And so, to contrast with the carpenter's mindset, I propose the cartographer mindset, which somehow reverses the hours and sees its job as a job of discovering abstractions in the business requirements. And that solves most of the problems, because when you see your job as a discovering process, you're not unhappy when uh, the business changes and when the requirements change. I mean, if I were a, a real cartographer and uh, I've built a map of some territory and I heard, receive a phone call telling me, Oh, there, is being, there has been a, a, a earthquake and a landslide in, in, the, in that territory, and you have to get back to them, to there, and, and rebuild the map. I'll be happy because the important part of the job is exploration. Drawing the map, it's the boring stuff. The cool stuff is to get in the in the in the territory and, and visit it, explore it. And actually, there is a method of creating software that uh, fits quite well this, uh, this mindset. It's called DDD. Um, and I like to think it stands for uh, domain-driven discovery, even if it's domain-driven design. But I don't like the word design in software, so I have to be career coherent, consistent. And there is a book uh, which is, I mean, I feel, much more important than the Gang of Four book, which is this book from the Basish Gosh, which basically mixes DDD with uh, the mathematical abstractions we have from category theory. And it will teach you how to, um, say, discover uh, monoid and functors and free monads inside the domain you are uh, modeling to, to produce software. So to sum it up, um, we could say that carpenters and cartographers are dual of, of, of one another. They are the same with the arrow, arrows reversed. The carpenter projects a plan, projects order onto complexity, whereas the cartographer extracts some abstractions from the same complexity. And of course, you should have understood that I prefer cartographer than carpenters. But 
If you've been listening carefully from the beginning, you should remember that we said earlier that metaphor are somehow something that we should be aware of. And carpenter and cartographer are merely metaphors. So we cannot completely ditch one or the other. Actually, abstractions are not enough to produce software. Do you know this guy, Alfred Kozybski? He was a Polish uh, philosopher and scientist from the 20th century. He f founded a, a branch of science named uh, General Semantics. And he has this very famous quote, quote uh, which says, a map is not the territory. Actually, he was uh, an officer in uh, the Russian army in, during the First World War. And the legend says that someday uh, his unit had to uh, march toward the enemy. And the map displayed a river across their path. And so the officers gathered in a, in a tent and started to wonder, well, uh, the map shows a, a, an area of shallow waters up north, but it's quite far away. And there is also this bridge down south, but maybe the enemy has broken it. So what should we do? And these officers with their mustache and so on, they think and pondered and, and, and it took hours. At some point, Kozybski was a little fed up. He got out the tent, took a horse and Gone to, to and went where the, the, the river was supposed to be. And he discovered that there was no, wa no water anymore. The river had drained. And the legend says he had this revelation at this moment that a map is not the territory. Which, to our problem, we should understand as at some point you cannot, uh, I mean, abstractions are not sufficient. We are there to produce value to, to users. So we, are, we need to make our abstraction concrete. And even if I'm way ahead of time, this leads to my, my conclusion that we cannot completely uh, be cartographers or carpenters. We have to be both. More precisely, when we are facing a, a, a complex problem. We should first send the cartographers to thoroughly map this complexity and extract as much abstraction as we can from that. And once we have a good map, we can then send our carpenters to build stuff on this new territory. For example, uh, when you work with Freemanets, first you, you write your algebra in an completely abstract uh, way. And then you use your crafty skills as carpenter to write interpreters that will map, connect back your, your abstraction to something concrete. So that's it. Uh, if we want to uh, be more at peace with software development, I think we should try to uh, be a little less carpenters and a little more cartographers. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, my name is Van Tyne, and you can find me online. And before I take question, uh, if any, I'd like to make a little announcement. Um, I am part of the team that organizes uh, Scala IO, and uh, so we are scheduled for early November and the C call for presentation uh, will open soon. So stay tuned on the Twitter handle. And that's it. Thank you very much.